can you folks hear me with the microphone? Is the working? Yes. 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 Okay, great. All right, I apologize for the short delay there. Anyway, um, thank you for having me in the introduction. I'm very glad to be back in Finland one more time. Um, I've been given the honor of giving this opening keynote presentation. It's kind of strange to give, to give me a whole hour for this topic, because quite frankly, you could compress my message into two words. The two words are, avoid novels. And we can all go home now. And I'm going to take an hour and explain why that is the message. So my topic is misinformation. Um, and as it says on my first slide here, um, regrettably, this is an area in the database world where things have gone very badly astray. Um, and correction is needed urgently. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, I, I say avoid nulls. I hate nulls. Nulls are disgusting. Nulls should never have happened. But the problem that nulls are supposed to solve is a very important problem. The problem is that information is often missing, incomplete. We have things like a speaker to be announced, or a present address unknown, things like that. So information is often incomplete in the real world. We need a way of dealing with that incompleteness inside our formal database systems. The problem is important. But it is widely agreed, it's not just me, it is widely agreed that no fully satisfactory solution to that problem is known at this time. And categorically, n value blocking for n greater than 2 is not a good approach. Now, I don't know if you know this, but nulls are based on what is called 3 value blocking. I'm going to say a bit about that later on. So, a relational model, by contrast, is based on conventional 2 value blocking. So, I'm going to argue that 3 value blocking is a very bad approach. In fact, a disastrously bad approach. And secondly, SQL attempts to implement three-value logic and gets it wrong. SQL manages to introduce additional problems over and above the fundamental problems of three-value logic itself, which I think are complete showstoppers anyway. But even if three-value logic was good, which it isn't, I still wouldn't touch the SQL support because the SQL support is even worse. I wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Oh, excuse me. Uh, three meter pole. <laughs> <coughs> and you see, the consequences of doing it wrong are absolutely appalling. Um, I've written many papers on this topic over the years. Oh, one of the terrible things about this subject is that people make all kinds of dreadful jokes. You get presentations of titles like Nothing to Worry About, <laughs> and Much Ado About Nothing, and so on. And I'm not immune. I wrote a paper called Not Is Not Not. I will explain that title in a few minutes. Another one, exists does not exist. And three value logic in the real world, and on and on and on. Um, oh yes, a funny story here. I used to do a regular column in one of the database magazines some years ago. And I wrote a column all about novels and how horrible they were. Now the only person I have ever met who really understood the relational model and thought novels were a good idea was Ted Cobb. Ted, the inventor of the relational model. Well, I wrote this column complaining about novels. Ted wrote a letter to the editor complaining about my column. His letter was longer than my column. We got into a debate in print, which the editor did see fit to call much ado about nothing. I'll say a bit about that debate later on. You can still find it on the internet. And as a matter of fact, it may be a good place to look if you're interested in this topic, because it does give a pretty good summary of the arguments on both sides, for and against. And my friend David McGovern wrote a paper called Nothing from Nothing. He's not immune to these silly titles either. Uh, my friend Hugh Darwin wrote a paper called How to Handle Missing Information Without Using Nulls. I recommend that one, by the way. And David Meyer um, wrote a book on the theory of relational databases some years ago. And he has a chapter on nulls and three body logic. He knows perfectly well that that stuff is not academically respectable. And he has this beautiful quote on the first page. It all makes sense if you squint a little and don't think too hard. <laughs> you see, that, in, in a way, there's a bit of a confidence trick going on here. If customers know they have the missing information problem. The vendor says, missing information? Don't worry about it. We have nulls. And the customer says, oh, yeah, that looks good. 
At first they do look good. It's only when you start poking into them you begin to see the problems. I remember I gave a version of this presentation some while ago to a DB2 user group. About a hundred people, and, and I did a straw, straw vote. How many people here, I said, have decided not to use nuts? And uh, about 50%, 50 people in the room. And then I examined further, and it turned out there was a very strong correlation. The longer the people had the product installed, the more likely they were to avoid nuts because they had begun to discover some of the problems. Well, anyway, I have to, if I'm going to attack now, I have to explain exactly what they are first. So I'm going to suspend disbelief for a moment and talk about what nulls are. The first question is, how many kinds of null are there? I will stay for the moment with the word null to mean, to be shorthand for meaning some piece of information is missing for some reason. So we might say, for example, Joe's salary is null. And what we mean by that is, Joe does have a salary because all employees have a salary, but we don't know what Joe's salary is. So in the slot in the database where Joe's salary belongs, we can't put a value in there because we don't know what value to put. So we don't put a value in there. Instead, we mark the slot or flag the slot. So let me point out right away, notice I always try to say null and not null value because one crucial thing about nulls is they are not values. They are markers or flags or slots. And by the way, we immediately run into a SQL problem here. Uh, SQL uses the phrase null value all over the place, and it's totally ambivalent. Sometimes SQL thinks null is a value, sometimes it thinks it isn't a value. You can see that's going to lead to problems. Anyway, why might information be missing? Well, there are many reasons. The value might not apply. Um, like the name of the spouse for an unmarried employee. Or the value might not be known, like Joe's salary here. Or the value might not exist. Uh, an example of that, um, uh, I'm from the UK, but I live in the US. And when I moved to the US, for many years I resisted getting a social security number. I didn't want a social security number because I know something about databases and I didn't want people to be able to look up my criminal record in their database. <laughs> <laughs> Funny thing happened that yeah, I pay tax over here, and I send my taxes in, and the tax authorities will say, oh, this man has no social security number, and they would invent one. And they'd invent a different one every time. And at the end of the year, I get a very rude letter from them saying, you owe us $10,000 tax because we have no record of tax paid under the social security number, and I said, of course, like in Turkey, that's not my social security number. Well, this went on for several years, and uh, the amounts got bigger and bigger, I'm glad to say. Eventually, I came in and got a social security number, and that's called welcome to the system. <laughs> but for many years, I didn't have one. And so the property of having a social security number applied to me, because it applies to all US residents, but I didn't have one. The value didn't exist, another kind of number. And there are many other reasons, I won't bother to go through all the details, there are many reasons why information might be missing, and therefore, in principle, many kinds of null. And you see, each kind of null has its own special properties, and its own special behavior. So to represent all these different kinds of null in the same way, and to manipulate them all in the same way, is clearly not the right thing to do. In fact, I would argue, a system that supports fewer kinds of null than you logically need is just as open to abuse as a system that doesn't support nulls at all. You see, one of the arguments in favor of nulls is that if you don't have nulls, you'll have anarchy. Everybody will do their own thing. Some people will represent this information by minus one, somebody else by 999, somebody else by a blank, and so on. Anarchy. And, and there is some merit to that argument, actually. But my point is, if you need three kinds of null and you only have two, you still have room for anarchy. In fact, SQL is the obvious example. SQL has one kind of null. It's explicitly meant to represent value unknown. I know that for a fact because I was there when it was invented. But because there's only one kind of null, people use it for purposes for which it was not intended. A simple example is 
using it for the commission for employees who don't get a commission. Employers are not salespeople. So you see, if you compute the employee's total pay, the formula is salary plus commission. If the commission is null, Siegel says quite rightly that the whole expression value is the null, so the pay is null. But of course that's the wrong answer. For a person not in the sales department, the pay is simply the salary. So that's a trivial example of getting the wrong answer because you've used the wrong kind of null. And I'm sure you can see much worse situations can arise in practice. Still on the question of how many kinds of null are there, I've kind of suggested that many valued objects are right, related to this topic somehow. Indeed, three valued object is proposed as a basis for dealing with one kind of null, the value unknown kind of null. Actually, Ted Codd, who is kind of responsible for inventing nulls, I'm sorry to say, he proposed not three but four valued objects for dealing with two kinds of null, value unknown and value does not apply. This kind of suggests that n kinds of null means n plus two valued logic. Well, three valued logic is bad. Four is worse. Five is worse again. And on and on and on. Do we really want to go down this path? I don't think so. <coughs> Still on the question of how many kinds of null are there, I don't know if you've seen this example before. But suppose we have the good old employees um, table with employee number, department number, salary, and commission. Suppose employee Joe's department number is unknown. So in particular, we don't know whether Joe is in the sales department. So what do we do about Joe's commission? We can't say it's unknown because we don't know whether the property of having a commission applies to Joe. And we can't say it doesn't apply because we don't know whether it applies. You see where this is going? It looks like we need a third kind of null to distinguish between the other two. If I call the first two null one and null two, it looks like you need a null three to say you don't know whether it's null one or null two. Are you with me? Now you need a null four to say you don't know whether it's null one or null two or null three. And on and on and on. In fact, it's obvious, in principle, we need an infinite number of kinds of null. Well, despite that depressing truth, for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to concentrate on just one kind of null, on the principle that if we can't handle one kind of null satisfactorily, we might as well forget the infinity case. And now, to make it very definite, it's the value unknown kind of null, I'm going to call it unk for unknown. The first question we have to ask ourselves about this unk thing is, what is the truth value of the comparison unk equals unk? Here's the situation. We've got one of these unk things in the database. Here it is right here. And then another one comes along. Question, is this second unk equal to the first? Well, the answer can't be yes, because if the answer were yes, this wouldn't be unknown anymore. We know something about it. We know it's equal to this. And of course, by the same token, the answer can't be no either, because if the answer were no, again, this would not be totally unknown anymore. We know it's different from this one. So the answer has to be, we don't know. And that is the third truth value. The value of the comparison, un equals un, is not true, not false, but unknown. The third truth value. That's why this is three value logic. Or more generally, the comparison x, comparison operator y, if either x is un or y is un, or both, the result is always unknown, the third truth value. Is unk greater than 3? Don't know. Is unk less than 3? Don't know. Is unk equal to 3? Don't know. Is unk equal to 1? Don't know. Is unk greater than and so on. So this is why it's three value logic. And here are some of the truth tables for this logic. Um, first of all, we <coughs> or not, of course, converts a true to a false and a false to a true. Not unknown is still unknown. That sounds a little strange in natural language, but it's correct because is unk greater than 3? Don't know. Is unk less than equal to 3? Also don't know. So not unknown is still unknown. For and, true and true gives true. Anything with false gives false. The other three are unknown. Unknown and true? Unknown. 
Shri Anandan, Anandan. Unknown and unknown, also unknown. For all, anything with the truth is true. False or false is false. The other three is unknown. And then we need another operator that I like to call maybe. Um, back up a second. Coming back to not. The purpose of not, very loosely speaking, is to convert a false into a true. Well, the purpose of maybe, very loosely speaking, is to convert an unknown into a true. So maybe true is false, maybe false is false, maybe unknown is true. What the hell is that about? I hate you, right? <laughs> well, suppose you have this query. You want to find employees for whom it may be the case, but is not definitely known to be the case, that they're programmers, and their date of birth is less than a certain date, and their salary is less than a certain amount. Well, you see, the people you want are precisely the people for whom the expression in parentheses here evaluates to unknown. Maybe then converts that to a true, and so you retrieve exactly the people you want. Because, of course, when you do a select in SQL, you select the top of rows where the condition comes out true, not false, and not unknown. Actually, a better way to say that is what SQL does is it converts the unknown into a false at the outermost level. That's really what it does. So that's why you want maybe. You see, this is what you'd have to do if you didn't have maybe. You'd have to say, uh, job is now and the other two conditions are true, or the date of birth is now and the other two are true, or the salary is now and the other two are true, or the job and date of birth are both now and the other is true, and on and on and on and on. That's why you want to pay me. So what I'm saying is, if you support three-value logic, which I don't think you should, but if you do, you should do it right. And doing it right includes supporting the maybe operator. Which brings me to another point, actually. Um, how many logical operators are there? Now, if you think about good old two-value logic, the only two values are true and false. Well, there are exactly four monadic operators because the input can be true or false and the output can be true or false in both cases, two times two and four. And there are exactly 16 dyadic operators because the two inputs can each be true or false and of the four possible outputs, each of them can be true or false, it's two times two times two times two is 16. So there are exactly four monadic operators in two value logic and exactly 16 diagrams. What about three value logic? Well, I will tell you. For three value logic, there are 27 monadics and 19,683 diagrams. For four value, it's 256 and over 4 billion. And generally, for n value logic, is n to the power n monadics and n to the power n squared diagrams. Well, this fact raises some very obvious questions. In the case of two-value logic, the four monadics and 16 diadics can all be formulated in terms of combinations of not and either and or all. That means if you have not and and, or not and all, you've got the not. Any logical operation, two-value logic, can be expressed in terms of not and and or not and all. It's an interesting exercise to prove that. I won't attempt to do it now, but you might actually think of that about it later on. Well, what about three value logic? What's a suitable set of primitive operators? You know, it, it, notice you see in two value logic, you don't need both and and all. They're not both primitive. Because either one can express themselves with the other. It's very convenient to have them for human factors reasons, but you don't need both. So, What's a suitable set of primitive operators you must have in three-value logic to make sure you have all 19,000 operators? Understand, you must have all 19,000 operators. Because if you don't, you don't have three-value logic. It would be like an arithmetic where certain operators are missing, like an arithmetic without a plus. What that would mean is there would be certain queries you couldn't do. What's more, it would be very hard to figure out ahead of time which queries you can do and which ones you can't. 
we have very hard to draw a boundary around the ones you can do versus the ones you can't. So, what's a primitive set of operators? What's a, a useful set? That's not the same question. As you've seen in two-valued logic, you don't need both and and all, but it's useful to have them both. That's an ergonomic question. There are plenty of problems of proving that what you've done is complete, testing, debugging, usability questions among. These are questions I have never seen advocates of knowledge even rate, let alone answer. Now I can explain that thing about not is not not. Suppose x is a truth value variable. Well, we're in three value logic now, so that, that variable can have the value true, false, or unknown, the third truth value. So x must have one of the values true, false, or un lower case, the unknown truth value. So if I say in English, x is not true, I mean x is one of the other two. x is false, or x is unknown. But if I say in the logic, x is not uppercase true, I mean x is false. Check the truth tables. So not uppercase is not the same as not lowercase. What I really mean by that is the not of the logic is not the not of natural language. So the scope for making mistakes is huge here. And as a matter of fact, I have a story on this one too. In that column that I wrote about nulls, I always used to have a little puzzle corner problem at the end. And I said a problem at the end. Um, and one of the people who wrote to me after that um, column was the guy who was running the SQL standards group at the time. He was incensed. He was outraged. He was furious with me that I was complaining about nulls. He went on and on and on about how I was completely wrong. And at the end he said, by the way, your problem is trivial and here's the solution. And he fell exactly into the trap of not is not not. It was beautiful. I couldn't have done it better if I'd written it myself. <laughs> Prove my point. And what happened actually, that, um, when I first started complaining about not is not not, some of the folks on the SQL standard committee said, oh my god, Chris is right. And they invented something, you can write C is not true, where C is a conditional expression. And C is not true is not the same as not C. So, in three-bounded logic, not uppercase is not the same as not lowercase. In SQL, not uppercase is not the same as not uppercase. Isn't that wonderful? And by the way, did you know that x is not null is not the same as not x is null? Here's an example. Suppose x is a row containing x1 and x2. Well, the, um, the left-hand side is defined to be x1 is not null and x2 is not null, and the right-hand side is x1 is not null or x2 is not null. They're not the same. In fact, if x1 here is null and x2 is not null, then x is not null and not not null. It's neither null nor not null. These folks have never heard of the law of the excluded middle. So you can have things in SQL that are neither null nor not null. See the kinds of problems of interpretation that are likely to occur. Furthermore, I have introduced two constructs. Unc uppercase, which is the null, unc lowercase, which is the third truth value. They are not the same thing. One is a null, one is a truth value. So unc uppercase is not the same as unc lowercase. And again, SQL has fallen into this one. You see, if x is a truth value variable, x has to have one of the values true, false, or unc lowercase. If I say in natural language, x is unc lowercase, I mean the value of x is known to be the third truth value. But if I say x is unc uppercase, I mean I don't know what the value of x is. They're not the same. And SQL has fallen into that trap. But SQL tries to support three value logic, but it doesn't have the third truth value. It uses null instead of the third truth value. That is exactly as bad as using null instead of zero to represent zero with numbers. It's exactly as bad. But well, there's a lot more I can say about the basic idea, but uh, I want to get into some sort of concrete examples. The implications of all this sort of relational algebra are um, <clears throat> whenever any truth-value expressions are involved, 
either explicitly like a restriction operation or implicitly like a join operation. It's the true cases that are relevant, not false cases and not the unknown cases. For example, when you do a join, rows join together where the join condition evaluates the true, not to false and not to unknown. But Ted Card invented some what he called maybe operators, maybe versions of his relational, or some of his relational operators. So, for example, a maybe join would do the join where the join condition evaluated to unknown instead of to true. Although, just as an aside, you wouldn't need those operators if you had my maybe logical operator, but that's a big fact. Well, some logical consequences of this formalism I've been constructing. X equals X does not necessarily give true. In two value logic, of course, X equals X is an identity, it's always true. But not in three. Because if X is uncouple case, it becomes uncouple case, which is uncouple case, which gives out lower case. Counselor X less than X doesn't give doesn't necessarily give false. Or if uppercase X is a set, in two value logic, every set is a subset of itself but not necessarily a free value product. If P is some condition, P or not P does not necessarily give true. Now, we all know this. This is why if you go to the famous suppliers and parts database and say, get the suppliers in London, and then get the suppliers not in London, you don't get all the suppliers necessarily. You have to say, get the suppliers who may be in London as well. Now, the reason for that is, the database does not contain the real world. It only contains the system's knowledge about the real world. And in the real world, there are only two possibilities. The supplier is in London, or the supplier is not in London. But inside the database, the system's knowledge, there are three possibilities. I know the supplier is in London, I know the supplier is not in London, or I don't know whether the supplier is in London. So it makes a kind of sense. But it's a kind of tricky point. And remember, you have to explain this to your naive end user. <laughs> R join R, in two value logic, R join R is equal to R, but not in three value logic. In two value logic, intersects is a special case of join, but not in three value logic, and on and on and on. Now, if you show a list of issues like this to most people, and I know because I've done it, Typical reaction is, eh, who cares? Who cares? I'm never going to write a query that says where x equals x. I'm never going to join a relation to itself. So why do I care about this stuff? Needless to say, that is the wrong reaction. The reason it's the wrong reaction is, inside these um, SQL systems, we have an optimizer, right? The optimizer's job is to figure out how to implement user requests. Basically, one of the things the optimizer does is take the user request, which is fundamentally an expression in relational algebra, and transforms it into another expression of relational algebra that is supposed to have the same semantics, but probably has better performance. Well, fine. But when the optimizer is doing those transformations, it's appealing to certain laws, laws of transformation. Those laws of transformation in turn rely on fundamental identities like these. And if the identities don't work anymore, the laws don't work anymore. And if the laws don't work anymore, the transformations don't work anymore. And if the transformations don't work anymore, you are getting wrong answers to your queries at the database. I have a concrete example to illustrate this point. Suppose we have a totally trivial little database, departments and employees, we have just one department, department two, just one employee, employee one, with the department of employee one, we don't know what it is. It's unked, uppercase. I'm trying to indicate that by shading the slot, because it's not a value, remember, it's a marker on the slot. Consider now this expression, depth dot depth number equals m dot depth number and m dot depth number equals d1. This could be an expression inside a SQL query. Let's evaluate the expression for the only data we have. Well, this is D2, this is uncouple case, 
So that comes to unc lowercase, and this is unc uppercase equals d1, which is unc lowercase, and unc lowercase, and unc lowercase, which is, is unc. So the expression comes out on that. However, a good optimizer, I don't want to explain exactly what I mean by good, but an optimizer very typically will observe that this expression is of the form a equals b and b equals c. And it will therefore infer that a equals c. And it will glue on another condition and get dot then number equals d1. I don't want to go into details about this, but as a general rule, that would be a good thing to do for performance reasons. But if we now evaluate the expression again for the only data we have, we get unc lowercase for that one, unc lowercase for this one, but this one is d2 equals d1, which is false. And so the whole thing comes out false. So actually, by gluing on the extra term, it changes the meaning of the expression. In fact, if the optimizer does this, it's an invalid optimization, but never mind for a moment. Now suppose we take that original expression and drop it down into a query. So there it is. Set employee number from debt n, where not of all that. Well, if the optimizer does its thing and adds the additional term, the expression in parentheses will evaluate for false, not a false is true, and we will retrieve the only employer we have, employee y. If the optimizer did not append the additional term, this expression will evaluate to unknown, not unknown is still unknown, that unknown is converted to a false, and nothing is retrieved. The details don't matter. The point is we get a different answer, depending on whether or not the optimizer appended the additional term. So note the implications for extending a two-value logic system to support three-value logic. This really happened. I have a particular product in mind that was out of the marketplace in the early 1980s, and it could not support nulls. And then the SQL standard came out and said, you must support nulls. So at this point, at best, you have to go back and re-engineer the optimizer to make sure that all the transformations it used to make are still valid in this new regime. At worst, you will now have bugs. Now, when I was investigating this topic in detail, it was a few years ago now, but I looked at some of the major products on the market. I looked at four optimizers on the market. I'm not going to name them because they've all been through subsequent releases. But uh, you would, I guarantee, you, recognize the names if I told you. I looked at four. I wanted to see if real optimizers had bugs in this area. And what I found of the four optimizers I looked at, the number that had this kind of bug was four. 100% hit rate. Every one of those products is giving you wrong answers. Note more generally the implications for extending an n-value logic system to support n plus one value logic. So you have these problems when you go from two value logic to three. You have them again when you go from three to four, and again from four to five. As a matter of fact, the higher up you go, the fewer and fewer transformations you can make. Just as an aside, the higher the logic, the less optimizable the system is. That's kind of interesting too. Nulls interfere with optimizing. On the third hand, I apologize for the title. Um, remember, the uncover case stands for value unknown. In the example, it means there is a value. Every employee is in a department. We just don't know what the value is. In the real world, that value either is department one or is not department one. If it is department one, my original blue expression becomes debt dot debt number equals D1 and D1 equals D1. Well, this is department two, so it's false and true, which is false. Alternatively, if the, the unc stands for something that is not department one, the expression becomes Debt dot debt number equals something that is not department one, and not department one equals department one. I don't know what this term is evaluates to, but the second term is false, so the whole thing is false. So either way, we get false. False is the right answer. And this is the real point. Three valid logic does not match reality. You understand? The answer that is correct in the logic is unknown. 
the answer that is correct in reality is false. The system has given you the wrong answer. That's why this three value logic stuff is no good for this purpose. It doesn't match reality. And by the way, this is not new news. Logicians have been studying what they call many value logics for something like a hundred years now. And it, they're fun, and there's all kinds of interesting things you can do with them. But one thing you can't do with them is solve the missing information problem. Because of this kind of issue right here. Three value logic does not match reality. And I have another local anecdote here in connection with that. Suppose we had suppliers and parts, but um, just as some sample values, supplier four has an unknown city, and this shipment here has an unknown part number and so on. And here is a query, and I've deliberately not shown this in SQL because SQL has special problems in this area. I've shown it in relational calculus, but it's very easy to understand. It's suppliers where there does not exist a shipment with the same supply number and with part number class two. What does that query mean? But basically, we're asking for suppliers where there's no shipment connection to part two. In other words, loosely, suppliers who do not supply part two. So the question is, what does the query mean? There are several possible interpretations. The first is what I just said. Find suppliers who did not supply parts two. Well, let me now point out that actually that first possibility is a non-starter. That can't possibly be the correct interpretation, even though it's what I said a moment ago, and even though it's what most people would say, given that query, as it would be the interpretation. It can't possibly be correct because this is a query that talks about the real world. And I said a few minutes ago, you can't ask queries about the real world. You can only ask queries about the system's knowledge of the real world. So does the query perhaps mean find suppliers who are not known to supply parts to? Or does it perhaps mean find suppliers who are known not to supply parts to? Now, I apologize for this. Um, believe me, the subtle difference between not known and known not is hard enough for native English speakers to understand. And I'm very conscious I'm presenting to an audience with a lot of non-native English speakers. But no, there is a logical difference between those two interpretations. Or does it mean suppliers are either known, not, or not known to supply not to, and so on. Now, true story. Um, uh, when I was working on this particular problem, I wrote a little memo with that sample database, the sample query, the sample interpretations. I said, which is correct? And I sent it to Ted, Carl, and I sent it to another friend, Matt Goodman. And we met in Ted's house, sat around the table for about an hour arguing about this. And we eventually came out saying interpretation B was the correct one. And then we broke out and I went home. And, you know, I'm very slow about these things, and I wasn't totally convinced. So what I did when I went home was I just played DBMS. I just mechanically went through the evaluation process. And what I discovered was, by God, interpretation C was the correct one, not B. We all got it wrong. Even Ted. And Ted believed in this stuff. What chance is there for the naive end user to get this stuff right? Vanishingly small. What chance is there for a natural language front end to generate the right SQL? Fairly small. And what is more, um, you might think the problem is with that exists operator. You might try using SQL's in instead of exists. People are frightened of exists. It seems to be complicated. Let's try it with in instead. You might think suppliers where it is not the case the supply numbers in the supply numbers for shipments of part two. No, that's not correct. Um, should perhaps append the following term, and it is not the case that maybe the supply numbers in that set of supply numbers. No, that's not right either. And if you look at these slides later on, take supplier three and see what happens. Do we have to add, and it is not the case the supply number is in the suppliers where maybe the part number is part two? Yes, that is the correct. Not obvious, is it? And what is more, um, given that C is the correct interpretation, how do you formulate a query for interpretation B? You must be able to. 
It's a, it's a legitimate query. Well, it says conclusion here. This is not the conclusion of the presentation, but it's the conclusion of this piece. I think you can see I've merely scratched the surface of problems of free value logic. I did mention that SQL has additional problems of its own. I would not touch knowledge of the intent for a call, as I said before. I'm sorry about this, but I have to recommend don't touch nulls. So what do you do? I said at the beginning the problem is an important problem. I've now demolished <coughs> the conventional solution to that problem, so I've left you with a problem without a solution. You've got to do something. Well, <coughs> I'll come back at the end of the presentation with some suggestions as to what you might do. Let me skip that for now. Um, I'm going for time. Um, I think I've got to skip some of these things. Uh, yeah, I will show you this one. Uh, duplicates in SQL. What does it mean in SQL for two values to be the same? I, I'll call the two values K1 and K2. What does it mean for K1 and K2 to be the same for the purposes of a comparison like in a web? What does it mean for them to be the same for purposes of key uniqueness? Like in a primary key clause. What does it mean for them to be the same for the purposes of duplicate el elimination, if you do a distinct or a union or something? Now, you're all SQL experts, you're supposed to be able to answer this question, but I, I, well, I wouldn't be that mean, I'll tell you what the answer is. <laughs> no two of those three statements are equivalent. The first one, the where clause stuff, follows the rules of free value logic. The second one follows the rules of an operating SQL called unique. And the third follows SQL's definition of duplicates. And in particular, if K1 and K2 happen both to be null, then the first one gives unknown, the second gives false, and the third gives true. So we apparently have three different kinds of equals in SQL. Did you realize that? This is not exactly a very solid foundation on which to build an elaborate structure like a database. Again, okay. oh, I'll show you where got out of joint. Um, I think we all know what out of joint is. If we have suppliers and shipments, and there are just two suppliers, S2 and S5, and two shipments, both are supplier 2. As we know, if you do the regular join, supplier 2 will join to supplier 2 twice, and supplier 5 joins to nothing, so there's no room for supplier 5 for the result. And that's kind of annoying if you want to do a report showing each supplier followed by all the shipments for that supplier. What you typically do is you join the tables together, right? You run the report right against the um, join. You do that, lo and behold, suppliers with no shipments disappear. This is a problem that customers discover for themselves very fast. <laughs> and so out of join is proposed as the solution to this kind of problem. Outer join is the same as the regular join where things match up. So these rows are the same. But then if you have a row like this one with no mate in the other table, you preserve that row of the result with nulls in the other slots. And the idea is you do the outer join and run the report right against the outer join. Well, yes. Um, outer join suffers from all kinds of nasty properties. I've listed some of them here. I won't go through them in detail. I'll simply tell you that many SQL properties are <coughs> over those nasty properties. And there's all kinds of things that you might think you could do in SQL that simply don't work. But the more fundamental question is, those nulls that pop up when you do an outer join, what do they mean? Let's look at another example. Suppose you have employees, departments, and programmers. And the semantics here are that all programmers are employees that some employees are not programmers. And for each programmer, we uh, show the programming language skill. I would assume for simplicity that each programmer has just one language skill. So it might say COBOL or SQL or something like that. So that's the database. And here are some outer joins we could do. A left has an outer join of N with program. I didn't mention this before, but I'm sure you know. A left out of join preserves rows from the left table with no match on the right. A right out of join preserves rows from the right table with no match on the left. And a full out of join does both. So, left out of join employs the programmers, backing up for a second, 
if Joe is an employee and Joe is a programmer, the two rows for Joe will join together. If Alice is an employee but not a programmer, what will happen in the result is that we'll see a row for Alice with a language of null. And the language null clearly means the value does not apply because Alice is not a programmer. So null language means the value does not apply. Suppose you are left out of a natural join of n with debt. Okay, so we're joining employees and departments over department number. Um, if employee 1 is in department 2, it joins to the row for department 2, that's fine. Suppose employee 10 is in an unknown department, so the department number is null. So it doesn't join to anything here, so in the result, the department number will be null and the budget will be null. So clearly, the null department number means we don't know what department this person is in. Budget is a bit weird. You don't know what the budget is, but the reason you don't know the budget is because you don't know the department. If you knew the department, you would know the budget. So, arguably, that's a different kind of null, but I don't want to press the point. Suppose you can go the other way, the left out of join the debt with M. Again, so <clears throat> if department 1 has 10 employees, there will be 10 rows for department 1 in the result. If department 2 has 5 employees, there will be 5 rows for department 2 in the result. <coughs> if Department 3 has no employees, there will be one row for Department 3 as a result, with a null employee number and a null salary. So that null employee number means the value is the empty set. There are no employees in this department. The null salary, I have no idea what that means. Um, I'm not even going to try to start with that. But anyway, the obvious question now is, suppose you do the full out of join, joining all three tables together, we get nulls popping up all over the place. We get at least three different interpretations of those nulls, and arguably as many as five. Different nulls in different columns have different interpretations. Different nulls in different columns in the same row have different interpretations. How on earth do we interpret the result? A few further thoughts. To wrap up. My first one is actually a very deep one, but I can't explain it here because I would have to explain a lot of the groundwork, so I'm going to skip that one. But the second, that there's an old riddle in English, maybe you've heard this. How many legs does a dog have if you call a tail a leg? Have you heard that before? What's the answer? Four. Four. Right. Calling a tail a leg does not make it a leg. So you see, we can say that unknown of our case is a third truth value, but that doesn't make it a truth value. I can say that is another integer, but that doesn't make it another integer. The set of all integers is well defined, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't add new ones or delete existing ones. Same with truth values. Or to put it another way, here's a proposition. Proposition. You are 45 years old. Now that proposition is true or false. I might not know whether it's true or false. But my not knowing is a whole different kind of thing from it actually being true or false. <coughs> Excuse me. Pretending that my not knowing is the same kind of animal as true and false is to mix up realms. And it's bound to lead to confusion and mistakes of interpretation, and indeed we know it does. I have several more further thoughts, but I'm going to be selective. Uh, consider Einstein, it says here, one of Einstein's most famous sayings is, everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. And in a way, that's the problem of nulls. Nulls are an oversimplistic solution to a rather complicated problem. Oversimplifying can be very harmful to your health. Further thought number seven. Um, yes, I, I guess I'm a little defensive about this in a way. You know, people often come to me and say, okay, you, you've shown us all these theoretical problems with nulls, but I don't care. You prove to me there are real practical problems. Show us, show us. 
I think, once again, though, that's the wrong reaction. I think we should turn that argument on its head. We shouldn't be defensive, although I am a little bit. I can definitely show you that nulls can lead to problems. If you think nulls are good and you want to have nulls in your database, it's incumbent on you to prove that you don't have problems. All these kind of issues I've been talking about will not occur. You've got to prove that. Can you prove that? Of course not. And when it comes to that, how do we know that there haven't been major problems caused by nulls? How do we know that there haven't been plane crashes caused by nulls? Or wrong medical diagnoses caused by nulls? Or bridges collapsing because of nulls? We don't know, because if one of these things happened, there'd be all kinds of pressures not to reveal the problem. Political pressures, commercial pressures, and so on. Legal, legal pressures. As it says on the slide, do you feel comfortable with the idea that as we speak, the United States Department of Justice is doing data mining on databases that are rife with nulls? I certainly do not feel comfortable about that. Number eight, the null is not a value, right? So you see a type that contains a null is not a type. A type is a set of values. A tuple that contains a null is not a tuple. Tuples are sets of components, and components are supposed to contain values. A relation that contains a null is not a relation, because a relation that contains tuples, and tuples do not contain nulls. Which means we are not talking about the relational model anymore. And questions like, does join still work? Well, actually it doesn't. In fact, it's very strange to me. Uh, um, we have totally undermined the foundations of the relational model. It's very strange to me that Ted thought this was a good idea. Ted invented the relational model in 1969. He invented nulls in 1979. For 10 years, the relational model survived very well without nulls. In fact, better without nulls. Then Ted tried to add nulls and has been fighting ever since. Well, I am eternally grateful to Ted for giving us the relational model in the first place. You know, we, we are all in this room right now because of the work that Ted Card did in the 60s and 70s. We, should, we all owe our careers and livelihoods to Ted's work. We can allow him one mistake, but it was a pretty big mistake in my opinion. And he's lost a lot of people's opinions too. Oh yes, in that debate, the, the, the much ado about nothing thing in print, Ted made a remark that was absolutely priceless. He said, database management would be easier if missing information didn't exist. <laughs> Way to go, Ted. Unfortunately, I didn't think he was joking. Okay, um, very quickly. So you have the problem, what do you do about the problem? Well, in simple cases, but I stress it has to be simple cases, you can use special values, or sometimes called default values. So the basic idea here is use special real values to represent the fact that some piece of data is missing for some reason. So jumping to the next page. If the genuine values of, of the salary column are money amounts, we might use three question marks to represent the fact that we don't know what the real value is. So notice carefully, therefore, the type underlying that salary column is not just money, it's money plus the three question marks. And the comparison of three question marks equals three question marks gives true. This is two valued logic. No three valued logic, no nulls here. This sim uh, simple scheme works in simple cases. But I have to warn you right up front that there is a problem. Um, the real problem is that the, the systems, the products, have all been designed on the assumption that you will use nulls. And if you make a very sensible decision to avoid nulls, you find yourself fighting the system all the time. It's like cutting wood against the grain. Extraneous considerations keep getting in the way. It's very annoying. Nevertheless, I think it is better than the alternative, which is using nulls. But that's a simple scheme. Um, a better scheme, uh, what Hugh Darwin proposes, is you design the database in such a way as to avoid a perceived need for nulls. If you have, for example, employees, over here I have employees whose salary is known. Employee two, we don't know the salary. So put employee two in a table of its own. This is a list of employees whose salaries are known. 
and list of the list of employees and don't get a salary. And of course, with this sort of kind of scheme, you can handle any number of kinds of knowledge or any number of reasons for information to be missing. Uh, you see, <clears throat> if you try to ram this stuff into all into one table, fundamentally what you're doing is you're mixing different predicates in one table. Again, I don't have time to get into detail about this, but that is a logically wrong thing to do. There should be one-to-one -one correspondence between tables and predicates. And mixing up different predicates in the same table, again, leads to problems of interpretation and so on. So along with this design scheme, um, there are techniques for, uh, and the obvious objection to this is you're going to do lots of drawings. Um, okay, well, we have techniques for dealing with that problem as well. I don't have time to go into detail. That's one possibility. Alternatively, um, David McGovern's scheme is similar but not the same. Here I've got suppliers, and I have one table that has all the supplier numbers. Here are supply numbers and their names. Here are supply numbers and state of values. Here are supply numbers and cities. And it turns out, for example, that supplier four, we know the name, we don't know the status, we don't know the city. Supplier 5, we don't know the name or the status or the city, and so on. Again, basically, it's a way to design the database to avoid the apparent need for nulls, and in particular to separate different predicates into different tables. Either of those schemes will work. If you want to find out more about this, you can read that paper of David's, Nothing for Nothing. You see, um, one of the wonderful, wonderful things that Wittgenstein said, well, we all know this one, Whereof one cannot speak, thereon one must remain silent. What good advice. And by the way, not just in databases, I wish people would take this one to heart. Uh, anyway, it, it always seems very strange to me that you put these null things into the database, which basically mean I don't know what I'm talking about. You're advertising the fact that you're ignorant. It always seems a funny thing to do. Record only what you know. It's a bad idea to say explicitly that you don't know something. It's all only what you know. And I will close by mentioning one last thing. Actually, I gave a presentation on this here in uh, Finland last year, the transrelational model. The uh, transrelational model is an abstract model for a story game. It's a way of implementing database systems that is radically different from all the ways we know in all of the mainstream SQL products today. And it has many, many advantages, including producing systems that are blindingly fast, and include, by the way, also including the fact that joins are linear. So to join 100 tables takes twice as long as joining 50. And by the way, you really can join 100 tables if you really want to. It has all kinds of advantages, but in particular, it fits very well with both Hugh Darwin's scheme and David McGovern's scheme. So, one day I want to see relational systems out there that really do support the relational model properly, and I'd like to see them implemented using the so-called transrelational model. By the way, trans here does not mean beyond. This is not beyond the relational model. It shall have a transform. The idea is to take the relations or tables, see where the user, and transform them into something radically different before mapping them down to the disk. Um, I think that's all I've got to say about that. In fact, I think that's the last slide. Um, 10.40. Ah. Um, um, I'm sorry, I haven't had any time for questions. It's time for a break now, but I'd be happy to talk to people in the break if they want to ask questions about any, anything. Meanwhile, thank you very much for listening.